Very good. All right. So <clears throat> again, thank you very much for being here. It's a great pleasure for me to be the, the keynote speaker at this event, uh, same as last time. Last year, I spoke a little bit about the trends, and let's say I had a bit of a retrospective on what was cloud computing a few years ago and what it is now. This year, I would like to even look a little bit more into the future. So we are a research institution. Um, our job is to have an understanding of what is happening in the domain, what are the important trends to come. And as you already can see from the, from the title, today my topic will be about what we call cloud robotics. The presentation here <coughs> basically um, sits on the background of our most recent research activity in our lab, which is led by Giovanni Toffetti, as well as by Tobias Lötcher, which is a new hire in our team, <coughs> and is founded in a new project that we have started with a quite innovative company in, in Switzerland. It's called Raputa, uh, which is an EC8 spin-off. <coughs> and basically, they bring in the robotics expertise, and we bring in the uh, cloud pers uh, pers uh, perspective or expertise. <clears throat> and what I'm going to tell you in the next 20 minutes is how what we understand under cloud robotics, what are the current issues, why this is relevant, and where we are at the moment in terms of development. All right? <clears throat> the World Economic Forum, I guess, is very well known in Switzerland for all those who have been following it recently, was full of robotics talk. Robotics was all over the place. And if you carefully look in your environment at the moment, you will see in the news, robotics are becoming more and more present. Why? Right? How many of you already have a kind of lawnmower at home that does it automatically? One, two, three. Christoph, you have also one. I know that. How many of you have a vacuum cleaner who autonomously walks foot? Christoph, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? So we see slowly that the devices, what we call autonomous robots, are penetrating our personal lives, all right? And indeed, what we see is that the robot economy at the moment is increasing. The economic potential is massive, especially because they are no longer just something which we see in their, let's say, big industry domains, but also in our private lives. Innovation capacity is enormous still. I mean, as you can see from, our, from the device at home, they're very simple still. Um, hopefully, they will soon be more flexible and more able. Than to do. <clears throat> we see also that that is important for us that, let's say, it comes out of research and it becomes relevant for the commercial domain. So there's a, a quite significant investment in venture, to, venture capital ongoing. And what we see is also it's quite a global trend. I don't know how many of you are reading Spiegel online. Not so many. Okay, it's a German newspaper, I know. <laughs> But for those who read it, you've seen there was a news just two days ago that the Chinese company is buying a company in Germany, which is called Kuba. Kuba is one of the world leaders in industry robots. Right? And the reason why the Chinese company is buying this is quite a big company with quite a big turnover. They have something like 500 employees or something like that. And the reason why the Chinese company is buying them is very simple. China has issued a new five years plan where robotics is at the top of the strategy. So China has a multi-billion US dollar investment confirmed to completely renew the whole manufacturing domain in the south of China. And we all know what this means. And the reason what they like to do is they would, not, they would like to get away from very manual labor-oriented production towards much more automated um, production by the means of robots. So what I'm saying is, indeed, we see lots of let's say, move in this domain. Robots are becoming important all over the place. And the question is, how can we basically be part of this? So at the moment, what we see here, this is a, again from the report from the World Economic Forum, is how many patents have been issued in the last couple of years and from which country or which, let's say, continent all over the, the globe, right? What we see here is that Europe is very low. Let's say America, the US, Korea, Japan, well, quite a bit, but look at this here. This is China. A massive increase in patents issued by the Chinese economy. Right? So question is, do they still copy? Or are they becoming one of the, you know, the leaders in innovation worldwide? Patents is something you cannot copy from someone else. Right? So, and... 
what we see is, and I have said this, that the trend behind all of this is that robots are no longer dominated by big companies like ABB or Siemens or whoever, who basically pro uh, produce large-scale industry-grade devices, which are, have hardware and software bundled, which are very, very closed, in fact, locked in, and which are, in the first place, very expensive. Now, what we see is, indeed, that smaller companies are becoming able to get into this domain because the hardware has become available and, as well, software has become available. So you no longer have to have a multi-billion dollar investment to get into the domain, but you can start using, for instance, open source, or you can start using affordable hardware, hardware at small scale. So, and this is exactly um, what is shown here. So this is our a few guidelines to exactly get in what we call enterprise and uh, robots for enterprise and personal services. So exactly to make a distinction, uh, a distinction between robots in the industry domain and the lawnmower at home, which we call a, a robotic device for personal services. Or if you have a small company, whatever, a small office, you're a company that does administration, and you have some device that does a little bit of logistics within an office. That's what we call a robot for enterprise services. And the design principles for this are very simple. Start simple. Be affordable. Yeah? No longer a big device for multi-thousands. Do one thing. Yeah? Vacuum clean, nothing else. But do this very well. Second thing is scale. So penetrate the area of your customers and then learn from your customers and start from one thing to get to the next and so forth. And that is very important, evolve towards autonomy. That is exactly what is at the moment the driver behind all of this. I mean, you've heard about artificial intelligence getting a, a kind of rewife after b being the hype 20 years ago. Nowadays, it's all over the place. It comes along with the big data movement and so forth. And it's very important uh, towards this idea of autonomous devices. And, and here, let's say it's the first hint towards cloud computing. Start building on an open platform. Do co-innovation. No longer develop something in-house just for your purpose, bundle it with the hardware and sell it and no one else can extend it or build on top of it, but just use it. How, how does this become able or enabled? Is by the availability of the so-called robotic operating system. That's the first, let's say there are many, but it's the first open source framework for robotic software development that has really proven to be taken up by a large community. It has re it was, it started, I think development started, Giovanni, four years, five years ago, roughly, right? And meanwhile, it has achieved, let's say, a, a community to, to build a community and a penetration in the community that we can say this is really a contender that seriously enables small companies to get into this business with, let's say, an affordable investment at the beginning. So, problem statement, uh, yeah, provide a software framework basically that allows, that enables co-innovation. So you do something, you use open source, you contribute it back to the open source community, someone else is using it, and keeps working on what you have been doing. And so there is a kind of cross-fertilization between multiple contributors and users. The idea is basically provide a software framework, you can also call it a platform, that enables you to not reinvent every time again and again for every new hardware platform, the fra basic framework that you need to, to control and develop an application on top of a robot. The concept is very simple. It's basically a set as a distributed system. So there's a number of software services, processes, whatever you want to call it, components, which you run on a single device, or, and here it becomes interesting, which you can run across multiple devices or multiple places in general. So, software development with ROS, a few core principles. What is the status today? It is still at the very, very, let's say, beginning of the development, and it is still very much focused on the device itself. 
you buy a piece of hardware. I mean, we've bought the TurtleBot for 2,000 Swiss francs, for instance. It's a very small device. You saw it in one of the pictures. Yeah. Um, and you basically deploy the ROS framework on top of it. Then you get some components you need, one for controlling the vision, one for a, a laser, for instance, to detect obstacles by while moving, another one that controls the, the, the powertrain for getting moving it from A to B. You get these components and you integrate them into your device as a distributed system, but it runs primarily local. Also, it is still a very manual task. So you can ask Giovanni and you can ask Tobias. You get all this software and they can tell you what a pain it is to install all of this on the one single device, get it up and running. You need to understand the hardware, you need to understand the, the, the software itself just for the robot, not yet for the application on top. And then basically get all of this running to get one robot to do what you, what you basically would like the robot to do. The problem also is it's still very diverse. So basically you, you want to do something and you get all these open source components, some are more mature, some are less mature, some are more capable, some are less capable. So there's still a bit of a, a higher heterogeneity, quite significant heterogeneity in terms of software and platform features that are available that you can really make use of. So there's still some kind of tweaking required, for instance. Also, there's some support for modeling and simulation. I mean, if you really develop applications for, for robots, you would like to model and simulate things before you deploy it on 20 devices and then they go crazy, for instance. Uh, there's a very basic concept at the moment for multi-robot scenarios. Um, there's no common approach to configuration management in multi-robot scenarios. Uh, and all of this is simply because there's a kind of lack of a unifying platform concept that supports all these modern software development principles, as we know them, for instance, from platform as a service offerings. So basically, all the benefits that the cloud computing domain has brought to, for instance, web application development or enterprise application developments by the means of using a common platform, which gives you all the features in a very mature state at the fingertips of, of, of you developing software behind your IDE with all the tooling for deployment, continuous integration, and all the stuff, as well as simulation and testing, is completely absent. Why? Because it's still a very young domain. And of course, it's a very heterogeneous domain in terms of devices. So, and that's exactly all of this, is still focused on just getting the software running on the device. But usually when you get the robot, you buy a robot to do an application in logistics or in health or in mobility, or whatsoever, or in law mooring, right? So the big problem is that in order to develop an application currently for robots, which the domain becomes accessible to you, why these frameworks, you need to be an expert in the device, in the operating system, in the platform ROS, and then again on the application that actually you like to develop. So you basically fuse or merge all the different expertises into one person that has to master all of this to get this robot going. And you can imagine how many people you have which are experts in logistics as well as experts in basically vision to control a robot that autonom autonomously runs through this building. Very difficult, right? So we have a lack of separation of concerns and that's exactly what cloud computing does to us in, this, in, in, in platform as a service. You no longer have to be an expert how to run the platform. This is done by the platform as a service provider for you. But this is absent in this domain, and that's what we have identified. And that's exactly what we then call cloud robotics. And I skip this because I've given this talk to someone else. Uh, they did not know what cloud computing is. You guys know what it is. Okay, I've given this to the robotics uh, community. And basically, what we, our idea now is that we say is the same principle as we have been, we know very well from, from cloud computing is that we would like to offer all this part for the robotics domain as a service. And by that, enable experts in logistics to use robots without having to learn how to get the piece of software running to control the powertrain in a robot. And how this looks like is basically this. So. This is what we know, a data center which has compute, storage, and networking resources 
we put the infrastructure as a service framework like OpenStack or CloudStack on top. Or we go even immediately a step further and we use Cloud Foundry, OpenShift or whatever. Uh, what do you guys have? Cloud Foundry? Cloud Foundry, for instance, right? And put that on top. And then the application developer has no longer to worry about what happens below this, but is simply consuming the platform and focus on what his expertise is, and that is to write code for a particular application domain. We all know that. We have a number of talks today, and I'm very happy to see also some controversial talks around this. But path at the moment for us is, is in the cloud domain, the number one topic for research left, because we consider infrastructure as a service mostly as a problem solved. But for the robotics domain, we have to move out of the data center. So we get issues of locality. In a data center, where the server sits on which you instantiate your container, who cares? All the servers are connected via gigabit, multi-gigabit Ethernet links, which are absolutely reliable. They are powered by under, uh, uninterrupted power supplies. Right? They have massive compute resources. They can tap into a num very big storage resources. And the, the resources which they offer are always the same. Storage, compute, networking. In our vision, we would like to invite all sorts of uh, integrate all sorts of devices. Of course, at the very basic level, they also offer network, compute, and storage. But now it gets interesting. They offer you an arm to grab something. Or they offer you a vision feature via a kinetic, or via a camera, or via a laser, to basically map the environment and by that become able to move autonomously. So we get a whole set of new capabilities which we have to abstract and then integrate into our platform. And the robots move. And while they move, their network connectivity may change or they may run out of battery. Right? So we move away with our platform idea from a very deterministic, very static, very, let's say, centralized resource configuration to something which at the very edge of things is very agile, very diverse, very whatever, mobile, and also very ephemeral in the sense that they can disappear at any point in time because the wireless, wireless connectivity uh, disappears or why the power runs out, you run out of power. Huh? Nevertheless, our idea is to integrate them into a one platform concept, offer the whole ROS framework as a service to the user, to the developer in that case, plus design, modeling, simulation, third party services, tooling, as well as software and configuration management, all those features that you know already from standard platform as a service offerings. Well, now you guys may say, okay, that sounds cool on slides, but can this be implemented? <laughs> is this just academic kind of like wishful thinking, or is it something that you can really implement? And of course, it's a very hard problem. And of course, it will never be the same like uh, whatever Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, or whatever can do in a, in a platform. But indeed, there are ways to do that, and that's exactly what we are currently researching on. I mean, I can skip the slides because that's basically what I was talking about, like all these issues that we have, heterogeneity of devices, multiple functions, ephemeral are the lack of a device repository, how to discover devices, the resource diversity, how to virtualize an ARM, for instance, if you would like to offer the ARM as a, by an API to a developer of a robot, or how to share a robot in general, and all these, these issues. So. Another set of issues that we have to deal with is how to design, test, and simulate. If you know development is Android, you have a bit of a similar situation. Because potentially, you write a piece of software that you roll out to, I don't know, thousands of devices. And before you roll them out to all these devices, and then basically the software is, is, is doesn't work, and all your, all your customers are unhappy, and it's very, very difficult to get it back, right? you would like to test it. And who has done Android software development in the room? You of us? Okay. So you all know there's an emulator that comes along with your software environment. And basically what you do is you develop your application, you commit it to the emulator, you test it in the emulator, and only if the tests are co completed, non-functional as well as functional features, then you really roll it out. 
right? So our platform has to provide exactly features for this test design, testing, and simulation. In Android, basically, the deployment is provided to you by the Google framework, the Google App Store in behind, right? So you, load it, you upload it there, and then your customers go there and take it. And if there's an update, the device will be notified and pulls basically the update. As you all know, that well, software update, and you say yes, 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 or you have it already automatically happening. For the robots, it's not any, not any different. At the moment, all done manually. But now try to imagine you are a small company, you make use of ROS, you, get, you make use of this myriad of new cheap hardware that is popping up, and you have the first customers. And Rabuta's customers are in Japan. So, and they sit here in Zurich. So every time when you have an issue, you send someone on a plane to Japan, doesn't really make sense, right? Or it's at least economically very, very hard, difficult to manage. So what you need is something like deploy and orchestration, continuous deployment, continuous integration, orchestration features to deploy your software also on remote sites. Again, the feature that the platform has to provide. Software configuration management, obviously, but most importantly, and that's a very attractive feature also is, I told you there is a number. I mean, if you go to the ROS website, you will find something like a thousand components that have been developed in the last three, four years by small companies, by universities, by the ROS Foundation, and forth, which are available to you. But the problem is you have to scan all of them, install them, learn what they are, check how much you they are, and then maybe use of them if they are appropriate for your particular problem. If they would be provided by you as a part of the platform, the same way as you use third-party services already, if you use Google App Engine, you can tap into all the services from, from Google in general. Or if you have a Cloud Foundry or an OpenShift installation and you basically integrate services from other service providers, then what you say is, I consume the service and the maturity, the stability, the resilience of the service is part of the service level agreement that I have signed with the provider. Right? So to become a platform provider in this domain can be very attractive. And is what we call a multi-sided service business. Of course, you have issues with monitoring, reliability, and resilience. Obviously, I mean, the robots may know, not just vacuum clean at home, and if they bump against the, the, the wall and then break, who cares, not a big deal, but they may also take some, especially in the enterprise domain, more responsible jobs. So you have to have some level of reliability and resilience that they no longer just disappear or whatever, do malfunction, and then ultimately even may hurt humans involved in all of this, right? And of course, safety or also accountability. I mean, you need to know what happened. You need to be able to trace back what was the issue and identify like ultimately like who has to be charged for a particular issue. And, and uh, our expert in rating charging billing is here, Piyush, right? He's had a talk in the afternoon as well as a booth out there. And the issue is, if you provide all of this as a service, how do you rate, charge, and build this? Right? It's very simple to say we share a CPU, but how do you charge sharing, for instance, a laser scanner on top of a shared robot, which is offered via your platform? As you can see, quite a number of hard problems. Uh, the question is where we are at the moment. And now it gets interesting, because when I first thought about all of this, I also thought, okay, mm, Sounds very good. Maybe we'll be able to publish a number of papers, <laughs> but will we be able to really implement it? That was then when we were working initially with Telecom Italia, interestingly. Uh, they have a quite developed, well-developed uh, robotics lab in Turin, right? Uh, and then met the guys from Rabuta, which indeed already had developed something very similar to what we thought, but it was not a platform. It was still very much at the infrastructure as a service level. Right? It was the result of a, of a big European research project called RoboEarth. And it was released in 2013 and it was called Rebuta Cloud Engine version 1 and it's open source. But again, as I told you, it was very much at the infrastructure level. So around 2014, we got involved with them. Then we had a number of discussions to the, until 2015. There was a redesign of the initial uh, Cloud Engine developed. And in between here and then, we engaged with them and we started developing the idea of this platform concept. 
And the current schedule is set such that we will have the first release, the initial release of the platform, somewhere in two, three months from now, Giovanni? September 2016, again, it's all open source. Um, and then along with the, let's say, the, the final version of the original cloud, the, the EIS-oriented cloud version by end of the 16, to have then maybe by, yeah, if this is September, maybe then this is a bit too ambitious, right? So maybe mid of 2017, yeah, I, okay. <laughs> so maybe by end of 2017, we plan to have the first uh, container-based um, platform issued and made available to the open source community, right? So in conclusion, what I'm going to say is that this idea of cloud robotics is basically not just fiction. It's not something that we are making up, but there are already first artifacts of artifacts. The principles are very clear. The problem is very well understood. And if you go to the uh, Google and you start Googling on cloud robotics, you will see there's more and more in this area coming. Very simply, because of to all robots conferences we have been going in the last couple of months, you realize that the issue of developing software is a very, very big one. Because all these, these, these small companies which get enabled now to make use of these open source frameworks, to make use of these new hardware coming up, have to still invest a lot in just getting the framework up and running. Although the money they make, of course, sits in the logistics application, in the health applications, and whatsoever. So stay tuned. Hopefully, perfect. Eh? Stay tuned. Check our websites. Talk to Giovanni and Tobias. Okay. I think you also have a. There's a booth out, so if you want to get, let's say, uh, you want to see whether we can walk the talk, take a few minutes in the break. Uh, really scrutinize the guys for. Say, is this really possible? What Thomas was telling, and they will be able to tell you uh, how much of this is a reality and how much of this will be a reality. Okay, and with that, thank you very much for listening to my talk, and I wish you a very great conference, and yeah, hope to have good conversation with you in the breaks. Thank you.